I'm sorry. Uh, what? Brandon. Yes. Yes, Paluka Brandon. And... Yes, yes. Let me get that right. Get that yeah. right. And uh, we're going to uh, ask Minister Tiffany to lead us in our opening prayer. Lord, Father God, we come before you and glorify your name this evening. We thank you for allowing us to come together with Bishop and Bishop Jackson for this Bible study this evening. Lord, I ask that you bless the readers and bless the word of God as it comes forth to knowing that it changes our lives. Thank you for this opportunity to fellowship and hear the word. Amen. 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 God bless each one of you. Heaven smile upon you. We have been in Luke chapter seven for the last several weeks, and we're going to continue there. We opened up talking about how Jesus deals with uh, tragic situations, with loss, with death, with pain, and with suffering. Tonight is no different than the other lessons uh, as we're in the seventh chapter and we see Jesus dealing. And when you deal with something, you handle the situation, you manage the situation, you approach the situation with the confidence that you can resolve the situation. And that's what we're gonna see in our lesson tonight, which I think is a very valuable and uh, a very, uh, let's say, uh, down to earth lesson. It's, it's a lesson that each one of us can relate to and find, preferably even find ourselves in this lesson. And uh, our lesson tonight uh, begins in chapter seven. And uh, we're going to start at 36. So if you all are, are there, if you are, uh, we're going to uh, launch into our lesson on tonight. Seven and 36. All right. Look carefully at that. You have it. I think uh, it's going to come up in the chat also. I'm going to pull up my chat. Yes, okay. Uh, 36, 37, 38. All right. Uh, let's look there. 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Okay, everybody get that? Everybody hear that or read that? Now, here's something I want you to see in verse 36. This is where we begin instruction. One of the Pharisees now, my friends, who are the Pharisees? There's Religious two leaders. Say that one more time. Religious leaders. Religious leaders. Right. Uh, yes, there's there's two major, well, there's several different sets, S E C S, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are in operation and at work in uh, Palestine in the first century AD. You had the Herodians, you had the scribes, there were the Essenes, there were the Sadducees, and in this instance, there's the Pharisees. The Pharisees were religious leaders. They were extremely religious. They're, their uh, specialty was the law of Moses. They were called lawyers in many instances, and they were concerned with uh, Hebrew law. They were concerned with uh, the jurisprudence of the word of God, which was the ruling uh, law in this first century. Uh, Jerusalem 
and Judea, even to this day, Judea, while it, it does have elections and it pretends to be a democracy, in all reality, it's a theocracy. And a theocracy essentially says that it is ruled by God. It has God as king, president, as ruler. So the Pharisees were, and they, and they don't exist anymore. The Sadducees don't exist anymore in Palestine. They were the interpreters of the law. Now they were very cliquish. Does anyone know what I'm talking about when I say that they were cliquish? What do I, what do I mean? They're cliquish. They were a group of people that stuck together. They stuck together. They were very protective of their own brand and they didn't welcome guests. They didn't welcome right. outsiders that in is. their clique. You know, when I was in high school, there's a, the jock clique. There's the get high group clique. There's the preppy guys clique. And then there's the, the nerdy clique. The nerdy, the nerdy clique. Everybody had, you know, their own group they ran with. Well, the Pharisees only dealt with Pharisees. They thought that the Sadducees were elitist, uppity, uh, self-righteous, and full of uh, indignation for the lower classes. So the Pharisees were like the working class, the middle class, but they were the upper middle class. Now, I said all that to say, when you look at verse 36, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he, meaning Jesus, went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, after my uh, preface that I shared with you about who the Pharisees were, what does that say to you about Jesus? That Jesus was a Pharisee because they invited the clique. Greg, I saw your mouth move, but I didn't hear your voice. What were you saying? That he really didn't care about the. Uh, no, he Jesus wasn't concerned about their uh, rank or their person or who they thought they were. But the reason why this Pharisee invited Jesus to his house. Is because Jesus was a Pharisee. Now, some of us will cringe at that. Catch our breath. Hope, you know, grab your head. Oh, my God. He just called Jesus a Pharisee. Well, the reason why I said Jesus was a Pharisee is because Jesus was proficient at the law. He was the expert. In fact, he was the master interpreter of the law. But not only the law, the prophets, not only the prophets, the poetry, all of the Old Testament, Jesus was the expert on it because he witnessed all of it. He would not have been invited into the house of a Pharisee unless he was of what they call equal rank. They would not have just invited Jesus to the house. This Pharisee wouldn't have invited Jesus to the house just because he was being friendly and kind and social. They were very concerned with their public image. And they didn't want to have anybody beneath them or someone they considered unclean or defiled or uncouth to be invited into the house. So Jesus here is seen in a place among those who would challenge him, who would criticize and critique him, but they knew that he was their superior because they knew that he knew the law better than they ever could. All right? So we got that established. Jesus is not only invited to come under this man's roof, which is to cross his threshold, 
which is to come into his personal space. But he was also asked to stay for dinner. Now, inviting somebody to dinner in our culture is not a big deal. But in this Hebrew culture, this Jewish culture, when someone, if a Jew invites you to his house, and if the Jew invites you to sit at his table, you are held in high esteem and you are seen as being one of them. They don't seldom invite Christians, seldom invite a Christian to sit at the table with them because you see the table was the place where everything was negotiated. The table was a place where decisions were made. The table was a place where they honored God. And so you didn't just get a casual invitation to come and sit at the table of a Jew, let alone the table of Pharisees who crossed every T and dotted every I. There was nothing casual with them. There was nothing, you know, uh, uh, kind of generic with them. Everything had to be by the book. So here comes Jesus to the Pharisee's house. And the word of God says in verse 37, and they reclined at the table. Um, how many of you own a recliner in your house? I mean, you got a recliner somewhere in the house. Everybody I got do. in the house say, I, I say, I. Raise your hand. Uh, yeah. All right, got a recliner. Hi. Okay, so what is it that you do in your recliner? You recline. You lay, you lay back. back. You lay back. You recline. You recline. <laughs> so in reclining, you kick back, right? Uh, now, uh -huh. When, when you and I think about somebody coming to eat dinner with us at our table, uh, we think about fine Thomasville furniture, you know, mm -hmm. with the high back chairs and the hard wood uh, table and, you know, raised three or four feet off the floor. And, and, that, and we say we're sitting at the table. But in the Oriental customs, when I say Oriental, I mean the Eastern customs. They don't sit at a fine table like we do. They lay uh, pallets, blankets. They lay uh, uh, like tablecloths on the floor. And they sit down low on the floor to eat together. But the word says that he reclined. So you might get the impression that he was sitting back in his chair with his feet forward. That, that would be the way we recline in the West. But in the Eastern culture, he sat on the floor with his feet behind him. You follow me? Mm -hmm. he, sat, he sat on the floor with his feet under him and behind him. How do I know that? Because in verse 38, it says, as she stood behind him at his feet. Now, if you were thinking that maybe he was sitting in his style with his feet in front of him, then she would have had to come stand on the table where they were eating. So I want you to get this picture vividly that Jesus is in the Pharisee's house all eyes are on him because they want to see if he follows all the Jewish customs, all the etiquette of that day. Did you wash your hands from your elbow to the tip of your finger? They want to know that. Uh, your so feet were unclean, so your feet definitely couldn't be near the table. Right. They had to be away from the table. Thank you. Absolutely. So in 37, it says a woman, it doesn't give us a name. Now, there are some theologians who want to throw this on Mary Magdalene. Not. <laughs> some of them want to throw it on Martha. Some of them 
want to throw it on uh, one of the uh, women uh, who's named in the scriptures, Luke is careful to say a woman. A woman that lived in that town who was sinful. Now, we're going to do deduction here, okay? We're going to do some deduction. There's not a lot of things a woman could do in that society, okay? So she wasn't, she wasn't in the halls gambling, mm -mm. okay? She wasn't at the liquor house getting towed up. Mm -mm. She wasn't walking the streets openly because a woman had to stay covered at all times. Mm -hmm. Head covered, face covered. All you can see is her eyes. Body covered. So she wasn't hanging out on the corner. There's really only one thing she could actually be doing in this era that would qualify her to be known as being sinful. Mm -hmm. That would have been that she was having adult sexual relationships, that she was engaged in the fornication. Now, here's the, here's the caveat that you need to catch. The, the sinful woman was known in the community, in the town, to be sinful. And her sin, of course, was something sexual. There, there's a very limited, thing, a limited number of things that women could do. She definitely wasn't out in the street cursing. Because she couldn't talk, she couldn't uh, openly talk publicly. So uh, the sinful woman learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. Now it's amazing how she, the sinful woman, the outcast woman, the woman they like to talk about, run a name in the mud, make fun of her. But she caught wind, she got a word that Jesus was at the Pharisee's house having dinner. Now you might say, well, that, that's not a big deal. Yeah, from a Pharisee. Well, the reason why I'm making a big deal out of it because only the Pharisees were invited to the dinner. Only the Pharisees knew about the dinner. But somehow the woman, the woman found out about the dinner. Could it be that oh. loose, loose lips sink ships? Uh -huh. One of the Pharisees must have told her. Uh -huh. And how would they know to tell her? They were, they were, so they were the ones that she be with. <laughs> they knew her. Oh, yeah, they knew her. They knew her. They, they knew, her. knew her. Oh, oh boy, did they know her. Yeah, there was pillow talking. Yeah. Talk to say it. That, you know, uh, what you say, Greg? They were pillow. Yeah, yeah. They were pillow talking. They were pillow talking. Yeah. They, were pillow talking. Yeah. they were dipping. They were dipping and slipping, sliding in the back door, making arrangements in the dark. But the woman overheard the conversation and got a piece of the information, and the mm -hmm. woman. The woman decided that this was her opportunity to break the generational curse. Ooh. Hallelujah. <laughs> this was her opportunity to stop living in the dark. Ooh. She didn't want to be the neighborhood prostitute. She didn't want to be the community Oh, don't call it what it is. <laughs> she wanted to come but out. None of the, but none no. of the Pharisees stopped her. That's right. And the, the reason why none of the Pharisees helped her is because, and y'all listen to this, it's because people want certain people to stay in the dark. Ooh. Amen. It's convenient to them. And they would rather you stay in a broken condition because they are benefiting from your brokenness. Come on. 
But this woman decided that she was tired of being in the dark. Mm -hmm. So when you're tired of being in the dark, what do you do? You go looking for the light. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And when she heard mm -hmm. that the, the, the light was at Simon's house, she went to the light. Mm -hmm. So 37, uh, uh, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, my friends, alabaster is something that's related to a, uh, a what we call a lime, L-I-M-E stone. But, mm -hmm. in, but in ancient uh, days, uh, it was more uh, rigid and strong. So they would use this material alabaster to make glasses, uh, uh, you know, uh, containers to make uh, uh, goblets, to make things to drink out of, but also they used it to hold fluids. And what she had was an alabaster box and and uh, the, uh, the term uh, really alabaster box is a little a little bit foggy. It really should be an alabaster jar, Ooh. an alabaster container. Okay, it's not not a box. What that container held was something called spike nard. Spike nard, and this spike nard did not come from. Palestine. It did not come from Mount Sinai. It didn't come from Mount Moriah. It didn't come from uh, Joppa, or Tyre, or Sidon. This spike nard came from a place called the Himalayas. Anybody ever heard of the Himalayas? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Himalayas are in India. And so spike nard is extracted from a tree in the Himalayas, and it is, it is shipped down to Egypt to be refined. So this woman came to Simon's house with an alabaster jar full of spike nard. Now, my friend, spike nard was not common. Mm. Spike mm -hmm. nard was not something you find in the 10 cent store in Bethlehem. Spike nard was high dollar stuff. It was uh, mm. like Chanel number 10. It was real nice. Real, real nice. The woman does not have a job, does not have an occupation for publicly. She didn't own property. She wasn't a rich woman, but she had an alabaster jar full of spike nard. What do you think? Where did she get that? She was a high class. Yeah, because of yeah. Pharisees and the oils and all of that. I'm with you, Gregory. She uh -huh. didn't got it from some visit. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you you wouldn't just go to the marketplace in Jerusalem and come across spike nard. Oh, she no. couldn't afford it. Couldn't afford it. Could not afford it. That's right, Paulette. It, it, it couldn't afford it. What many people in town could afford that? That had to be imported. She brought what one of her clients gave her. And it was the best thing she had in her house. Mm -hmm. Of all the things she owned, it was her best piece of property. And she brought that to Simon's house. 
What do y'all think about that? Dr. Jazz, I have a question for you. <clears throat> I did a little bit of reading up on it, and since she was supposed to have been the harlot, could uh -huh. she have not collected some of this stuff as payment for her sins with these men? Uh -huh. that's, that's, uh -huh. that's the point that I'm making. Mm -hmm. That's my point, Beverly. She yep. didn't get that locally. That was compensation. Say that again, Paula. What's, what's amazing to me is, and I may be wrong, but that Pharisee didn't put her out. Or if there was other Pharisees, didn't put her out of the house. They let her stay. I thought of that too, so Paula. I thought of that too. Huh? <laughs> I thought of that too because yeah. they're not speaking of any other women there, but they allowed her to be there and stay there. Yeah. 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 might have been the one that gave her the who hallelujah could have brought gave her that. <laughs> was his he was, was familiar his with these yeah. men. And his lady. Now, 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 y'all, 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 way up in my story, y'all too far. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm not there yet. Y'all need to get there. Okay. Well, us women think ahead of time. Yeah, I know women, women are far ahead of me. But anyway, so she came in with this really, really high dollar perfume. And in 38, she stood behind him. They were all reclining on the floor. She found Jesus and she stood behind him and she stood there weeping. She was unloading years of guilt. She started unloading years of shame. She started unloading years and years of being in the dark. And she mm -hmm. cried so much that she began to rinse his feet with her tears. Now, Jesus had walked to uh, the house of this Pharisee. And when he walked across the road, across, across the pathway, of course his feet got dusty and dirty. This woman is crying so profusely that she begins to rinse his feet with her tears. But then she did something that really should have made the Pharisees gasp for air and, and cry out blasphemy because she took off her tunic, her tunic. She took off her oh, yeah. and she took off her face covering in public and let down her glory. Notice it says she wiped his feet with her hair. <clears throat> According to the uh, uh, Old Testament scriptures, a woman's hair is her glory. Mm -hmm. Have y'all read that? Have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The woman wipes a man's dirty feet with her glory. That was unheard of. Most of them, because they operated in the dark, had never even seen her hair. She unfurls her hair that has taken years and years to grow, has never been cut. And she uses her hair as a towel to wipe his feet and then she uncorked, she broke the top off of that alabaster and poured spike nard 
very costly on not on his head, not on his neck, not on his face, on his. This is a major act of humility, a major act of submission. This woman was broken and she brought her brokenness to the only one who could fix her. Mm. And around the table were theological scholars. Around the table were professors of the law. Around the table were the rulers and the leaders of the community. But she skipped all of them. And she performed an act of humility on behalf of the rabbi. Uh, Pamela has pulled up for us 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen, But if a woman have long hair, it is for her glory. For her hair mm -hmm. is given her for a covering. Mm -hmm. She uncovered herself for her covering. Oh, that might preach Sunday. Anyway, let me go on. <laughs> so, so we have the setup here. She has performed this act of humility, and now we get the backlash. Are you ready for the backlash? Okay. The backlash comes in the form of a interpersonal thought. This was not anything that was said out loud. This is not anything that was indicated by a sign language or message or code. This is the inner thoughts, the inside thoughts of the host of the dinner who's at the table, sitting across the table from me. Mm -hmm. And the look on his face when this woman performed mm -hmm. the humility is priceless. And Jesus looks at the scorn on his face and reads the imprint in his heart. Jesus says, oh, I, oh, dude over there judging. I see, I see him over there judging. Hadn't said a word. Try to keep his face, you know, try to keep his face together, but it's his face. It was written all over his face. So Jesus said, uh, hmm. now no, let's go back to what Simon says in 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he didn't say it out loud. He should have known. <laughs> <laughs> if this man were a prophet, he would have known. He would have mm -hmm. known who he was touching. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> I know. Anyway, he would have known <laughs> he was touching and what kind of woman she is because she's a sinner. And I know mm -hmm. she's a sinner. Mm -hmm. Because she's a sinner with her. How you I, know? How you I know, know? I know firsthand that she's How a sinner. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, when Jesus read his book, and, and you better be careful around prophets. So gotta be careful around people who are prophetic because they read your mail. You haven't even opened your mail up yet, and they'll read your mail. So, mm -hmm. so Jesus, said, <laughs> Jesus says, uh, huh, Simon, I have something I want to tell you. And he doesn't go into a parable, he goes into an allegory. Okay. He goes into a what? An allegory. Okay. He goes into an allegory. He says, I want to tell you something. Now, I want to uh, just uh, interrupt right here because what Simon was expecting was that Jesus was going to tell him 
how wonderful <laughs> his house was. Mm -hmm. He thought Jesus was going to tell him how wonderful the dinner was. <laughs> He thought Jesus was going to express to him how impressed he was with all the important leaders that he had around the table. He was waiting on Jesus to, you know, brag on. Mm -hmm. and, and we've met a lot of people who do stuff for show and, and, and they just, just can't wait for you to say something good about what they've done. Leg them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They, they want to get, you know, they want to get their props. You know, man, I, I went all out. I went and got T-bones for this meal, man. Take out that. I got the good stuff. And he was waiting on Jesus to chime in, just tell him how great it was. But Jesus went into a allegory. And um, Simon, was, Simon so, was so anxious to hear about uh, how glorious the meal was. He was like, yeah, yes, teacher, tell me. Tell me what you, got, what you want to tell so Jesus said, now, two people owed money to mm -hmm. a certain money lender. Two people mm -hmm. owed one man money. One owed him 500 denarii. Mm -hmm. 500 denarii in our uh, understanding today, in our financial setup today, owed him about $10,000. Uh, the other one owed him five or mm -hmm. fifty. Fifty denarii is about a thousand dollars in today's money. So one owed ten thousand, the other owed one thousand. Still a good bit of money. But in 42, it says neither of them the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, Simon, which do you think loved him the most? Who do you think would be the most grateful and the most appreciative? The one who was in debt 10,000 or the one who was in debt 1,000? Which of them will love him more? Simon is now on the hot seat because he's sitting in front of his bull. He's sitting in front of his peers and he can't wiggle out this in front of them because it's a fair question. So he has to come up with the logical answer. And so he, he doesn't say for sure. So to try to cover himself, he says, well, I suppose mm -hmm. the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. I'm not sure. I don't want to go out on a limb and say that guy who owed the most, but I suppose. See, that's leave, trying to leave a back door or a way to back out of it when he gets busted. Mm. Mm. Lisa says, you have judged correctly. And of course, he thinks that he has now passed the test. He's good. The table is full of other Pharisees. And the, the rabboni, the master teacher, has said, you answered correctly. So all the other guys are probably shaking their head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus then say Uh-huh. Jesus turns the table on him and said, Well, Simon, do you see this woman? I like that that's what Jesus said in this. That's the first thing Jesus said. He said, do you see this? In other words, she is somebody. Yeah. You all have treated her like nobody, but now here in front of God, do you see her? <laughs> She's not just some object. 
She's just not some thing. She's not just some piece of meat. Simon, do you see her? Do you see her not only with your natural dirty eye, but since you're a Pharisee, do you see her with your discernment? Mm. <laughs> do you do you see uh -huh. the real do you see this real sister standing here? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Jason, um in that comment right there that Jesus is asking, and mm -hmm. I know you haven't quite gotten to this part, but even this woman had I'm trying to put it had no rights to be there, right? So therefore they didn't have to show her any courtesy at all, right? Right. But Jesus makes Simon acknowledge that the woman is in the room. Right. And too, too often, we overlook people. We ignore people. We step over them, go around them, avoid them act like they don't exist and they are people too. Come they on. are in the room and they have significance. So Jesus made them all, since he was talking publicly and openly, they all had to look at her. And they saw her differently. That's why he said, do you see this woman? Then he goes further. Because that question was rhetorical. Set up, he set him up. He says, I came into your house. Mm -hmm. You invited me to your house. I didn't ask to come to your house. You invited me to your house. When I came to your house, rather than treating me like the guest of honor, you did not give me any water to wash my feet. Now, we're in first century Palestine. And they're not walking on sidewalks. They're not walking down the highway. They're walking through the muck and the mire. And a person on the level of a Pharisee would normally have a servant or a slave. And when you entered their house, and there wasn't a lot of people that would enter their house, but when you entered their house, the servant would uh, have you sit down and the servant would wash the muck and the mire off your feet and then take a towel and dry your feet. That's what Jesus did at the Last Supper. Yes, Greg. What I got from that is uh, the guy that owned the $10,000 and the guy that owned the $1,000 yes. and the lady. Uh -huh. Jesus looked at all of them equal, like no sin is bigger than the other sin. And you're sitting around this table acting like your husband's out. When y'all did it, just as cruddy as this lady that's behind me that's trying to redeem herself, but y'all still sitting in the dark like y'all didn't do anything. So he put them on the forefront. I agree with you totally. Yeah. He, ex he exposed them for who they really were. Yeah. Now let's go, let's go further. Listen to Jesus. Jesus has some criticisms and he really puts this um, man who's supposed to be, you know, all that. He puts them on the spot. Uh, I came in your house. Uh, I had just come off the road, my feet dirty. You didn't give me any water to wash my feet. But the woman who you ridicule, the woman who you look down on, she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. <laughs> She treated me like I was special to her and like I was her guest. Let's go a little further. He said, you did not give me a kiss. Now, I, I want you to understand their culture. Yeah. Uh, and, and this culture still exists of uh, uh, people of uh, Oriental and Middle Eastern and Far Eastern yeah. customs. Yeah. When when they uh, see a brother or, or when they come into a, a fellowship with one another, the they cheek, the cheek. on the right cheek first and then the left cheek. And, the left cheek. Uh, and, and that's a sign of uh, humility and fellowship and love. But Jesus says, I came into your house as your guest. 
you didn't kiss me. They felt like they were Jesus' equal. Right. I ain't you, have to. You ain't no special guest. You, you my equal. You, you, uh, you invited me into your house, and you treat me like I'm nobody important. But look what it says. He says, you did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing, not my face, but kissing my feet. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Just, uh, just um, um, now you really got me because to, uh, hearing you say this, they did not recognize who he was. They couldn't have if they didn't greet him in the way that they should have, not washing the feet, right. the kiss, all right. that. They, even the knowing what was on their heart. That's right. That's right. They really disrespected him because inviting him into their home for dinner was not to celebrate him, but it was to interrogate him. Mm -hmm. some, okay. some people want to have fellowship with you and, and you know want to talk. You know, some folks will stop you in, in, in the, uh, the uh, produce aisle at Walmart not to be happy to see you, but to try to get in your business. Mm -hmm. I be telling them, I'm going to send you a W-4 since you like to know my business. Send you a W-2 because you want to get in my business. Listen, he goes on. He says, and you did not put oil on my head, which was very common. Why was this very common, y'all? Somebody tell me why it was so common. He says, you didn't even put oil on my head. What, what was so important about that? Protection. Yeah, protection and all Anointing. Being a Pharisee. Yeah, the anointing. By a, yeah. Well, I, I'm going I'm to put it in more practical terms. They lived in the desert. It was hot. Yeah. It was hot. <laughs> dry skin. Hot, hot. Dry, dry skin. <laughs> and, and if your head is exposed oh to the heat, then, then when you come in to sit down and relax, you put some olive oil in your hair, on your head, to relieve your dry skin. You know, you might have been a little, might have been a little ashy. You know, so brothers get ashy. <laughs> so what happened? He said, "You didn't put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume." Costly on my feet. Therefore, I tell you. And Jesus does not mince words. He's not in the dark. He, he's not you know, operating uh, on a, assumption. He says in verse 48, therefore, I tell you her sins, which are many, her many sins, been forgiven as she as her great love has shown Jesus knew her history he knew her background he knew her sin but he also knew she wanted to be free from her sin she wanted to be liberated she didn't want to live in the dark anymore Jesus says I know her better than you. I know her sins, and her sins are me. And in some comparison, in his comparison, me. also, Bishop, something I found out when he was talking to the Pharisees, he also he always referred to his face, his head. When he was talking to her, he was always referring to feet. She lowered herself to a position of low. Of way low. I'm the scum, the feet, where he said, You didn't anoint my head, but she my feet. You did not pull mm. all on my head, but she went kiss my feet. I get that. So I get he, that. Was showing, he was showing, you missing it, dude. You yeah. think you the high up right. and you didn't do the things up high. You didn't even anoint <laughs> high. And she went way mm -hmm. low to anoint. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Amen. Jesus makes a great parallel for us to see, to witness here on how you treat a guest, how you treat someone that you invited to your house and how you deal with someone who has a broken heart in your house. Yes. 
can I uh, uh, can I assume by him doing this in front of all of those Pharisees that he's letting her know, he's letting them know she's free of bondage, like leave her alone now. She's yes. all and she's forgotten in sins. Yes. I I agree with you, Greg. I think that Jesus is yeah. calling them out and he is breaking the curse that they have inflicted upon her. Mm -hmm. And he has given her an open door to, to, go. to go and yeah. never go back. Because listen how he finishes it. Mm. Let's go a bit, a bit further. We we were yeah. 47. Uh, but let me fit uh, let me he says in 47, but whoever has been forgiven little, love little. Yeah. In other words, you take for granted. And you act like it's not important because your sin is not so public and so wide open. But all sin is sin. And those who sin weigh heavy on them, they come with the right heart. They come with the broken heart, with the contrite heart. And because you think you know the law and because you think that you can interpret the law, you don't appreciate the redemption and you don't appreciate the healing. You don't appreciate the salvation that's right in front of you. 48. Yes, ma'am. Right Dr. Jackson, listen to you say that. Does that mean that the forgiveness either the same way they didn't appreciate those facts, their forgiveness is different as well. Some give, forgive more, some forgive little. I mean, is is it, I'm asking you a question. Do people forgive in different ways? I mean, help me out here. Is forgiveness yeah. not forgiveness? Forgiveness is always forgiveness, but some people have a level of unforgiveness that they can't really embrace or appreciate when they are forgiven. Some people That's rank the, sin. So they're, 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 Say that for me again. Some people can't embrace forgiveness in its fullness because they haven't forgiven in their heart and therefore they can't receive and accept the forgiveness that comes to them. So it's hard for some people, it's, some, it's hard for some people to accept the fact that God will forgive them because they don't forgive anybody. Or themselves. And if they don't forgive anybody, they don't forgive themselves. Amen. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jess, I, I got to tell you this before you go any further. And I thank Please God do. for the message because you know something, I needed to hear that. That is a battle I've been fighting with all day long, all day today, all Jeez. day today. Yes. And to hear you say it tonight, mm -hmm. I can't begin to express what that means to me. And I really did need to hear that. Let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Praise right God. I'm not going to story, but I, I need to pray, right? Ooh, hallelujah, Jesus. Right, Glory are. to your name. Lord, Thank please. Lord. Lord, have mercy on us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. And teach us how to forgive ourselves. ourselves. Lord, please help us. Help us to get past the pain. Help us to get past the shame and the agony. Lord, we know that you not only forgive, but you forget and throw it away. Hallelujah, Jesus. Not to keep going back in the trash can and pulling it back out over and over again. Thank you, Jesus. God, help us to forgive ourselves for things that happened Thank you, Jesus. 20, 30 years ago. Thank you, Jesus. Last week, Hallelujah. Last. Help us, Woo. God. As you have put it behind you, Lord, help us to put it behind ourselves. Yes, Lord. Yeah. First. The first act of love is to love oneself. Yes, Jesus. Thank yes. you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Help us, Lord, to not only seek Lord. your Lord. forgiveness, Lord. 
but to seek our own forgiveness of ourselves. Yes, Jesus. Satan, we bind your hands against us right now. Yes, Jesus. Every thought that you keep bringing back to our mind, every remembrance that you keep bringing back so it will keep us in that dark, lonely curtain. We expose it. We shed it. We tear it down. We pull it apart. And Lord, we don't go back to retrieve it after we say it is over. It is over, Jesus. It is over, Lord. It's over. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. In your name, amen. 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 Give us, give us, Lord, the strength to forgive ourselves. Amen. Yes, Lord. I want you to hear the end. I want you to hear the end, and we're going to be done. Yes, Jesus. 48. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Mm. Yes, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Praise. Just make this bold okay. declaration. Okay, because he is the son of God. Yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. Because he is the spirit of God. <sighs> and because he is the mighty God. Yes, Jesus. Yeah. But not only that, Thank you, Lord. but because he's going to Calvary, where every sin is going to oh. wash away. Thank you, Jesus. So he says, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Yes, Lord. The other guests who sat around the room, who sat around the table, they never heard this kind of talk. They got all jacked up. They start <laughs> grumbling, you know, nudging each other. Who is this who would even forgive sins? <laughs> then Jesus goes even a step further. Thank you, Lord. Really alienate them in their ignorance. Yes. Lord. Says <laughs> your faith. Your faith. Yes. Jesus is really introducing something that we will carry on throughout Christianity, through our faith in, in him. He says, your faith has saved you. Not your acts, not your deeds, not the law, not your sacrifices, but your faith has saved you. This is the concept of Christianity that we we put all of our trust in this concept, faith. Yes. Your faith has not only has it healed you, but it has saved you. Amen. Amen. That she can go, but now she can go in peace. Amen. <laughs> she can go in peace Amen. because She's through with these jokers. Uh -huh. <laughs> she could go in peace yeah. because they all sit yeah. there looking at each other. Don't come. Does this Would mean that I can't go to the house no more? <laughs> That's what they want. Uh -huh. Does this mean I can't slip in the back way anymore? That's exactly what it means. You are all uh -huh. exposed to who you are. And she is leaving, and she's leaving in peace. Leaving saved in peace. <laughs> saved and in peace. That's why he tells no, 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 us. One more. I got to add, add one more. Okay. Forgiven, saved, saved and peace. And in peace. Mm -hmm. That's a mighty powerful combination. <laughs> you need to make sure you write that down somewhere, and that as you go through your day, for the rest of the week, you need to remind yourself, you need to look at that piece of paper or on your phone or whatever and say, I am forgiven, I am saved, and I am walking in peace. I am forgiven, I am saved, and I am walking in peace. And your enemies will not know how to deal with you. Ah. <laughs> Amen. Right there, yes. They will not know how to take you. Because you are not only a soldier of the Lord, but you are forgiven. You are saved. You're walking in peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why he tells us to even accept him. I stand at the door and knock. Any man let me come in. I will suck. 
just like yeah. he was doing. Yeah. I'll sit down with you. And sup with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. My friends, you are forgiven, saved, saved. and walking, walking in peace. God bless you tonight. Amen Come for that thank word. Thank you, Lord. Thank Amen you. for that word. Hey, bless the name. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. We are, we're going to wrap up with our weekly offering, our Wednesday night offering. Uh, if you're giving tonight a cash up, please send your sacrifice, your blessed offering to dollar sign Citadel of Faith. Also dollar sign NBBC clothing. Uh, we all have um, a different cross to bear, but we can bear it together when we join in in unity and give, and it shall be given unto you. So please don't forget our sacrificial offering tonight. This word has blessed you. This word has given you uh, a new peace. Then please uh, send a love offering, a Thank you, offering to the Lord for our lesson on tonight. Next week, my friends, as we finished up chapter seven, chapter seven was something else, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. We mm. did it. We did it. We did it. And so on it. next. God did it with us. Hallelujah. Right. Thank you. Hallelujah. Next Wednesday, we will pick up at chapter eight. <coughs> I thought that chapter seven was going to take up my whole eight weeks, but we'll pick up at eight and uh, we're going to have a good time in chapter eight. So uh, please uh, go ahead and read for us. Be prepared. Uh, happy to have each one of you. Thank God for each of you tonight. I pray that uh, the Lord has moved upon the altar of your heart and that you heard or felt something that will carry you through the week. Until next week, remember, you are forgiven. And walk, walk in, in peace. peace. Amen. 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 Now Amen. when you are able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now henceforth and forever. The people of God said amen. 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 Don't forget that this uh, Sunday is, uh, this weekend rather, is First Lady's weekend because it's First Lady's Day on Sunday. Work in the ministry yeah. of Bishop Dr. Pamela Jackson. The uh, First Lady's uh, luncheon is at 2 o'clock on Saturday. And First Lady's Day is Sunday morning, 11 and uh dinner following so please remember her she's such a warrior such a, a prophet such a leader and such a wonderful woman who god has blessed us to keep her around for a long time yes yeah Amen. we thank god for our first lady and look forward to you sharing with us thank you all so much love thank you, you. Love you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Tiffany, Hello. check your email. Tiffany. Yes, I responded. Awesome. Yes. All right, Dr. You. Bambi. Good Bless to you. see you. Glad that Winston Salem was Yes, in. I was okay. like, one minute. And it came on Greg's birthday, too. I was like, <laughs> Happy birthday, Greg. Happy birthday, Gregory. Greg. Happy birthday. Thank you. Are you 40? Thank you.